Hello, everybody. And uh, I know that uh, many, some of you in the process of joining at the moment, this uh, uh, second of our Power Institute Image Complex talks for the year. My name is Mark Ledbury. I'm the director of the Power Institute. And before I hand over to my colleague, um, Nicholas Crogan, and our guest and speaker today, Zeynep Chelek alexander um, I just want first to acknowledge that, of course, the University of Sydney is built on the traditional lands of the um, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I wish to pay my respects to the um, elders of the Gadigal people, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge the uh, many tens of thousands of years of traditions of cultural custodianship and learning that have taken place on this land. I um, am delighted to welcome you back, and I know some of you will be joining right now, and some of you in the course of this intro. Um, and I just want to, um, uh, you know, thank once again and hand over to Nicholas Crogan, who will explain a little about the series. And as you may have uh, got used to by now, we'll, uh, we'll also introduce you to Zainab, our, our distinguished guest speaker today, um, via a, a series of questions and, and a little bit of background on, on Zainab and her work. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, um, all of you have joined now. But remember that we have not only this series, but two other uh, talk series that you can join in with. We are also running uh, an exciting series of panels in, in uh, for those of you uh, closer to us in Sydney, uh, in conjunction with, with the Light and Darkness show, which um, highlights uh, the not often seen works in the um, power collection at the University of Sydney. Um, it's on at the Chow Chak Wing Museum and we're convening panels uh, uh, around it. And those, those will be on the museum website and our website, but please join us, please, um, you know, like and subscribe, as they say on YouTube, go, go and join up and you will be, I think, surprised and delighted by the very variety and uh, amount of events that we're curating in the course of the year. So thank you for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Nick. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Nini Nalawangun, Mari Bujiri Gadi Noreda. My name is Nick Krogan. Um, and I say these words uh, in the Sydney language to, as a way to pay my respect um, as a person of white settler heritage uh, to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose unceded land um, I live and work and where I'm joining you from today. Um, these words mean uh, we meet together on the very beautiful Gadi country. Uh, and while we're meeting virtually today, I think these words are a good reminder that virtual space uh, is always bound to uh, material and historical places. So as Mark mentioned, today's lecture is the second in a series of public talks that the Power Institute uh, is hosting this year entitled Image Complex. So the term image complex uh, was coined by the US activists and scholars, uh, Yates McKee and Meg McGlagan to describe the infrastructure that has arisen in recent decades uh, to produce and circulate the image world that now forms such a dominant part of our lives. The image complex is not just one place or thing, but it's rather an always shifting network of people, institutions, technologies, and platforms. At stake in the image complex is thus not just the content of what we see, but rather what is seeable and what it means to see it all in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Image complex points to a much longer history of vision, understood not as something universal, unchanging or natural, but rather as the product of distinct historical and political forces. This year, uh, we have invited four leading international scholars to help us explore the contours of the image complex. Uh, we began in March with Mackenzie Wark, um, and today we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Zainab Chalik Alexander. Uh, and later in the year, uh, we'll be hearing from Lisa Nakamura and Tina Camp. Uh, all of these thinkers um, are, I believe, leading a really exciting new wave of thinking about visuality, one that builds on, but that also breaks from earlier visual culture studies in really important ways. Um, its strength um, is to center perspectives that art history uh, has traditionally obscured. Colonial histories, queer and trans life worlds, radical black aesthetics, and the powerful body of work, um, scholarship and theory produced by queer women of color. These thinkers and perspectives allow us to see our contemporary image complex not as 
and immovable machine, but rather as a complex and unstable assemblage, vulnerable at all moments to rupture by alternative histories and possible futures. Uh, so as I mentioned, today's speaker is Zeynep Chelik alexander one of the thinkers who has most influenced my own thinking about the image complex. Uh, she is Associate Professor in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University in New York, uh, where she teaches the history and theory of architecture since the Enlightenment. Uh, she's the editor of Grey Room Journal, um, a member of the Architecture Collective Aggregate, and has authored a number of really significant books, articles, uh, and essays. Um, rather than listing all of these, uh, we're going to begin today, as we uh, usually do in this series, uh, with a short uh, interview um, to outline Zeynep's um, intellectual trajectory. Um, then um, Zeynep will present her lecture, uh, and then we'll have some time left over at the end for Q&A. Um, and we invite you to submit your questions using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so thank you so much for being here today, uh, Zeynep, in the evening for you. Hi, Nick. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am delighted to be here. And you're in uh, New York at the moment. I am in New York, indeed. Um, I, I, I'm greeting you from my um, apartment at Harlem, not on campus, but from Harlem. They're very close by, yes. Um, I wanted to begin today by asking if you could tell us a little bit about your um, how you found your way into um, the history and theory of architecture? Well, I found my way into the history and theory of architecture through an architectural training. So I was trained uh, probably for too many years as an arch architect. So I studied first at Istanbul Technical University. And then I um, continued, even though I knew I wanted to be a historian, I continued um, studying design at Harvard GSD. And then I, it was only then that I decided to turn to history theory. Um, so this is not that unusual as I'm sure some in, in the audience would know in architectural history, it's a little different from art history to have been trained as an, you know, professional architect before turning to uh, history theory. So mine, like many of my colleagues, but not all of my colleagues, I also have colleagues who come directly from art history, um, went through the professional training and even a little bit of architectural practice before turning to um, scholarship. Mm. And I know that in your recent work, you've kind of returned to thinking about the kind of techniques and skills um, and practices of the architectural profession in particular. Um, but before getting to that, I wanted to ask about your first book, um, which, um, as I've told you, is one of my favourite art history texts. Um, oh, it's, <laughs> it's called um, uh, Kinesthetic Knowing, Aesthetics, Epistemology, Modern Design. Um, it was published, uh, wait, it's getting blurred out, but uh, <laughs> published in 2018 uh, by University of Chicago Press. Uh, could you tell us what kinesthetic knowing is? So, I mean, this actually comes out of my own background as someone who studied architecture. I quickly realized when I studied architecture that this was something that was not like the, you know, the methods I had learned in high school in terms of either, you know, you would study the sciences and there were certain techniques you followed versus the humanities where you would read and write and interpret texts and so on. I realized uh, that th there was something else involved here in design education. And it was um, never fully theorized. It was never fully articulated what it was. And I remember the first time I arrived in the US, uh, my you know, my academic advisor, I said, I'm nervous about not being able to speak English properly. And he said to me, well, there is another language you speak and that's the language of architecture. And I said to myself, I said, what is he talking about? I don't understand. So in a way, the book is about that, that this um, alternative mode of knowledge, um, which I call kinesthetic knowing, but in uh, German, it goes under other names and philosophers have um, 
called it other things in the past, a kind of knowledge that is presumed to be carried out by the body as opposed to by the mind. And what I discovered in researching uh, for the book, which was my dissertation, is that this kind of knowledge was, people always talked about this kind of knowledge and people presumably always practiced this kind of knowledge, but at the end of the 19th century, at the moment when artistry emerged as a, a discipline in the university, this kind of knowledge was theorized to be a kind of knowledge suitable especially for those uh, lesser minds, so to speak. And at this moment, that meant women, children, uh, anyone from the working classes. So it was really thought of as a mode of knowing that was appropriate for um, these uh, lesser subjects, if you are lesser cognitive subjects, which then found its This way is sort of at the turn of the, this is sort of early 1900s, that, turn of the that. century. One of the things that surprises uh, people, for example, is that, you know, we think of theory of form or theory of um, space as something associated with modern design, but these were actually implemented in secondary education in Germany before they became courses at the Bauhaus. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what the book is about. It's the history of this other kind of knowledge. And, and it's sort of one of the most revelatory aspects of the book, I think, is the, the sort of end point is something that is quite familiar to art historians, which is, you know, the Bauhaus. Um, and um, your book tells the story, one of the stories that, um, you know, explains the, the particular mode of teaching and producing that happened at the Bauhaus and the kind of prehistory to that in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, I like to say when back when I still talked about that book that, you know, most histories of modernism begin with the Bauhaus, mine ends with the Bauhaus. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what I mean, the Bauhaus so stopped by any stretch of the imagination, but I thought it was important to put it there to um, show uh, the trajectory. One of the things you mentioned in the intro that I wanted to um sort of draw you out on a bit is um, another afterlife of this kind of mode of knowing is um, the sort of more recent fluorescence of um, thinking about affect and affect yeah. theory. Um, yeah. Is there any, if you could say a bit more about that? I mean, if I can be very blunt, I am also critical of at least some of the less critical uses of affect theory, which I think um, frequently presume a similarly um, uh, a lesser subjectivity of sorts. And I think of something like Brian Masumi's argument about how um, Reagan um, was someone who had to be understood not for what he said, but rather for the affect that he uh, conveyed when saying it. So it's on the one hand, a pardoning of a kind of conservative politics. On the other hand, um, one that I think presumes a certain kind of audience that I also find deeply problematic. So I'm not exactly a friend to affect theory. Uh, <laughs> you can see how um, this kind of thinking uh, might have gone there. Of course, this doesn't um, mean all affect theory is uh, under the burden of that kind of history. But I think some mm. strings of it, I believe, are. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of the, the sort of theoretical um, apparatus that your work mobilizes so um, powerfully um, is, you know, draws from a number of sources. And um, uh, I know that you are, you're an editor of the, the journal Grey Room, which has, of course, been a really important source of um, ideas connecting um, architecture and art history and media theory. Um, and you're also part of a, an architecture collective um, called Aggregate. Um, and I think um, there'll be some questions about those two um, bodies in, in the Q&A section. But um, I wanted to skip ahead to your most recent book, um, which you edited, um, called Design Techniques, Archaeologies of Architectural Practice. Um, and um, is there any if you could tell us uh, what, what are techniques uh, and how do they relate to um, perhaps a more familiar term like technology uh, yeah. or media? And what is the intervention that you're making with this book? 
Um, so, I mean, that was an intervention. Actually, we just also, um, last Friday, we had the book launch for another edited volume that came out um, from Agrodedit. My name is not on it. I was one of the editors. It's called Writing Architectural History. And I realized in talking about this uh, book that uh, writing architectural history is a pedagogical um, intervention for those doing PhDs and design techniques was an intervention uh, in design education. So for, I mean, I taught at an architecture school for many years. So my thinking came from that. I mean, techniques uses the, you know, it's very Germanic, I guess, the German uh, uh, term technique, which is both technology and, and technique. So it refers both to artifactual technologies, but also practices. And to me, this is important, and this is probably informed by a certain kind of media theory that insists on, on, uh, insists on deontologizing concepts even concepts as entrenched as, say, human, by uh, looking at the techniques that make those concepts possible. So it um, operates with a certain kind of history of science, with a certain kind of inspired by media theory, but I think it tries to be fundamentally a very materialist kind of take on history. That's uh, where it comes from. But in the design techniques, it's a book, each chapter is, um, uh, dedicated to a particular technique, like I wrote the one on scanning, there's one on rendering, there's one on modeling, and these are attempts to understand historically how uh, certain concepts in architecture emerged as a result of a set of techniques. Yes. And these are techniques not not as um, thinking of, of scanning and, and um, you know, objects like the ruler and so on, not just as um, instruments that are used by humans or that perhaps are an extensions of humans, but rather kind of trying to articulate the space in between. When I when we started that project, and this was a very, maybe we can talk about it later, it's also a, was a very, very collaborative project. We started by considering those artifacts and it turns out the artifacts, while important, are not nearly as um, important as social practice. So we ended up prioritizing the social practice over the uh, artifacts who, of course, inevitably make their appearance in, in these histories. Mm -hmm. um, well, on that note, I'll pass across to you, um, hand you the mic to, for your lecture, um, which I think will bring us up to date with your um, most recent research project. Um, so uh, thanks so much, and I look forward to, to chatting with you again um, afterwards. All right, so thank you again. Nick, for this invitation. I'm very happy to be presenting uh, to this particular audience at the Power Institute. And thank you for coming in the morning, uh, my evening, and um, I'm delighted to be here. So as Nick mentioned, this talk is from my forthcoming book and I've organized it in four parts. So let me start uh, with part one with this. On September 23rd, 1841, when Thomas Sopwith, mining engineer and mineral surveyor, spoke at the Yorkshire Geological Society in England, he began by showing his audience a blank chart. 15 inches by 20 inches and engraved with a grid at a scale of 40 feet to an inch, the chart was designed so that it could be filled in with geological sections. By then, the construction of railways and expansion of the mining industry had become mutually reinforcing phenomena in Britain. Early rail cars were designed to carry out coal out of mines. The steam engines that now pulled them and ran the pumps that kept flood water out were powered by the same coal. More relevant to Sopwith's arguments, these developments meant that British land was repeatedly being cut in dramatic ways for mines and railways, giving geologists unusual opportunities to see Earth's mineral composition in section. Sopwith argued that the geological information thereby revealed should not go to waste, but rather 
be collected, as in this example, using copies of the blank charts. The sectional information was not only important to the discipline of geology, it was crucial to the future national prosperity of Britain, to the improvement of agriculture, mining, construction, and so on. The chart in question had been printed by the Museum of Economic Geology in London under the leadership of Henry de la Beche, the founder of that institution, as well as the first director of the geological survey. Even though it had been firmly established by the 1820s that Earth had a stratified structure, most geological work still primarily consisted of making plans. De La Beche's own career demonstrated geology's representational dilemma. He had started out as a gentleman geologist, coloring maps of Pembrokeshire before embarking upon a geological survey, also in plan, mind you, of Jamaica during a visit to the island to attend to his family's failing sugar plantation. In 1835, when with the blessing of the Geographical Society of London, he became the first director of the geological survey, his primary task was to color and mark maps produced by the Board of Ordnance. Yet, De La Beche understood as well as Sopwith that studying Earth's structure sectionally was absolutely crucial. But because sectional information was so hard to come by, he recommended that geologists draw what he called ideal or annex sections. These were horizontal sections that reconstructed the stratigraphic and topographic transformations of land over long distances. Since geological observation was inherently discontinuous, however, a degree of guesswork was needed when constructing such a section. The geologists had to abstract strata as more or less continuous layers, separate them into clearly demarcated zones, and mark them with colors, letters, and numerals for legibility, as you see in, this, in these images. Top width sections, by contrast, were vertical. These tall and thin columnar sections showed Earth's strata only at crucial points. Both kinds of sections showed what the most meticulously constructed geological plan, plan could not. But top width vertical sections abstracted horizontal sections further by visually restoring disturbances, such as folding or faulting into perfectly parallel layers. Crucially, this additional step of abstraction made it easier to aggregate sectional information. Thus reason sought with that if a regular series of sections of railway cuttings could be collected in a systematic and standardized manner, the British government could create a central registry to make them available to entrepreneurs interested in agriculture, mining, or railway construction. Geological and economic thinking were closely related in the early 19th century. In 1835, when the Geological Society charged De La Beche with the task of establishing the geological survey, its members argued that a systematic survey of Britain's geological resources had countless economic advantages. It would help find coal and precious metals, locate sources of underground water, aid the construction of canals, railroads, and tunnels, and identify chemicals crucial to the artificial improvement of the soil. Yet, as Sopworth explained, mineral wealth was different from other kinds of wealth in that it, in the extreme uncertainty of its existence and the difficulty of its recovery, which meant that prospecting for a mineral had conventionally been no different from hoping to win the lottery. With the introduction of systematically arranged mineral statistics, however, exploiting these resources would become a different kind of endeavor. Instead of relying on chance, entrepreneurs could now depend on data to make intelligent choices, even in a global economy with 
unpredictable price fluctuations. While the goal of standardization remained elusive, the idea of forming a registry of mineral statistics was realized when dozens of vertical and horizontal sections, along with geological maps to which they were keyed, came together in the mining records office of this building that I'm showing you now, the Museum of Economic Geology. It later became known as the Museum of Practical Geology. The first museum was founded in London in 1835, but my focus here will be in the second address of the museum between German and Piccadilly streets in London, starting in 1851. Situated in a narrow infill site, the building was designed by the architect James Pennythorne for the Office of Works with advice from the Labesh. These are early uh, versions of the design. And things are a little um, delayed. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, in addition to exhibition galleries, which as you see here, occupy the heart of the building, the museum accommodated a large lecture hall, chemical and metallurgical laboratories, a library, a model room, several offices, the largest of which was the mining records office. The lecture hall in the basement served not only the government school of mines, which was based in the museum until 1872, but for a small fee, also the general public. World War I caused structural damage to the building as a result of which it had to be demolished before its contents were transferred in 1935 to South Kensington. The new Museum of Economic Geology has been compared to natural history museums that came before and to commercial museums that came after. But it, it, in many ways, it was a different kind of creature. And here's the primary exhibition hall again. It was, for example, unlike, unlike the old Ashmolean Museum, which displayed mineral specimens as wonders in a cabinet of curiosities. The museum, uh, the specimens in the Museum of Economic Geology were selected not as rarities, but rather as representatives of the average. As one contemporaneous observer puts it, this was mineralogy in its working not in its dollar dress. In this sense, it was closer in its logic to later natural history museums in which one wasn't supposed to wander, one was supposed to learn. The museum was also not entirely like the commercial museum type that succeeded it in the late 19th century, the kind of museum that provided information about the origins of a material and the means of obtaining it. While it provided an abundance of information to the entrepreneur and to the casual visitor alike, it did not have the advanced indexing systems that characterized these later institutions. Rather, the information here was in the service of what contemporaries called rational entertainment or rational recreation, a form of leisurely pursuit that was distinguished from lowbrow pastime activities. This rational recreation, in fact, was closely linked to the cultivation of an economic sensibility that Sopwith, Dolabesh, and fellow geologists recognized as a core mission of geology. It was none other than Robert Peel, the conservative politician who would spearhead the repeal of the Corn Laws, who argued in 1841 that rational recreation was leisurely education in the service of worldly pursuits with the goal of becoming better men of business. This required information of the kind that Sopwith called for, that is standardized information that was method methodically collected, stored and made retrievable. In addition to the mining records office, which collected, stored, and distributed geological information, the museum regularly published vast amounts of gray literature, 
memoirs, reports, and almanacs filled with mineral statistics, most of which in the later decades came from the Ptolemies. Even the design of the displays was determined by an informational logic. Sopwith noted how specimens were arranged with every reference to instruction and to situations from whence obtained, all of which carefully marked not only on the specimens themselves, but also on good maps. This, in fact, is the argument I'd like to make. The Museum of Economic Geology was a proto-database in that it structured geological information in ways that I'll analyze in this talk. The building is one of my case studies um, in my uh, the book that I'm trying to finish, Imperial Data, an Architectural History of Storehouses of Information in the British Empire in the 19th century. It's also of interest here, I hope, because it produced a 19th century version of an image complex that was marked by what I would call sectional thinking. The images produced in the building, but as we will see also by the building, served as an object lesson in political economy. They created a discursive platform that made it possible for a new kind of economic sensibility to be thoroughly naturalized. This, of course, was the moment when Britain was entering a period of the severe policies in the middle of the 19th century. This was arguably the museum's most important lesson as a site of rational recreation. A single extraordinary mineral specimen in a cabinet of curiosities might produce wonder. A complete series in the vitrine of a 19th century natural history museum might educate and even impress upon the visitor a theological lesson about God as the ultimate creator. The displays in the Museum of Economic Geology aspire to something else. In the process of tracing minerals to their origins, understanding their properties, and thinking inventively about their potential economic uses, the visitors learn to think as a homo economicus, an entrepreneurial subject imagined to be endowed with intrinsic calculative abilities to seek wealth. This, it turns out, meant learning to think through images of architectural and geological sections. Which brings me to part two. The elaborate section of the Museum of Economic Geology must have been designed in response, at least in part, to the unfavorable lighting conditions dictated by the deep and narrow infill sites. The primary exhibition spaces consisted of a main floor and two cantilevered uh, galleries. I hope you can see my uh, uh, cursor. These are the cantilevered galleries here. Uh, and they, these galleries wrapped around the central atrium. They were illuminated by a 43 foot tall iron and glass roof. A horizontal glass pane in the center of the galleries right here let this light into the 400 person lecture hall in the basement. The horseshoe footprint of the lecture hall determined the spatial arrangement of the rest of the building, the laboratories, a model room, a library, and various offices, including the mining records office, were situated along the German and Piccadilly Street facades in the spaces left over in the plant from the footprint of the lecture hall and the galleries. The mining records office located here on the second floor, I'm pointing out with my cursor, was the only office space that also had a cantilever gallery. The building section was designed such that it could only be accessed from the quieter German street. Visitors climbed up two short flights of stairs before entering the ground floor galleries were a selection of British marbles, famously collected uh, for the Houses of Parliament were on display. Then they ascended a more ceremonious staircase to find themselves in the great room of the primary exhibition galleries. Historians have pointed out that the spatial arrangement of these galleries resembled 
a geological section. The display cases were arranged in striated layers as if visitors occupied an oversized model of Earth's strata. But the architectural section did not strictly follow the logic of a geological section. In fact, the main floor of the exhibition hall dedicated to mineralogical and petrographical specimens had an entirely different spatial arrangement than the galleries. As an early guide explained, the organization of the uh, main floor was in the first place topographic and in the second place economic. And here with red arrows, I marked the way that the visitor's um, gaze was supposed to go up and down the section as they walked around in the uh, main galleries. And the point here was to show the trajectory of a product from its origins to the point where it became um, industrially manufactured objects. So in the foreign mineral section, for example, a cross section through the display cases reveal the progression of the so-called Siberian base from the crystals resourced from the Altai Mountains. So this was dictated by geology, oops. The chronology was the organizational principle of the British fossil exhibits in the two cantilevered um, galleries. Here, Paleozoic fossils in the lower gallery progress toward the Mesozoic and Cenozoic fossils in the upper gallery. Instead of being arranged as a stratigraphical column, however, the display cases wrapped around the two gallery levels, inviting visitors to experience the vertical layers of earth horizontally while making their way from west to east. This was a significant choice. When the museum opened its doors in 1851, the, there was a debate between uniformitarianism and catastrophism. And at stake was the question of causality. Was earth the result of gradual evolution or disruptive events? Was what was the role of God in it and so on? Furthermore, another perhaps less known debate known as the Devonian controversy was only beginning to cool. This one is more relevant for our purposes. This one involved none other than de la Biche and his successor as director, Roderick Murchison, and it had implications for the 19th century scramble around the globe to prospect for new coal deposits. It was about how close to the surface coal deposits could be found. Fossils were considered to be stratigraphic markers. So separating um, fossils from mineralogical specimens meant that the museum's curators purposefully hedged their beds and avoided both of these controversies. The point then was not exactitude. In this sense, the architecture of the Museum of Economic Geology can be compared to Sopwith's isometrical drawings. While Dulabesh warned against the mischief of adopting a scale of height differing from that of length, Sopwith used exaggeration in geological representations to make certain things more uh, visible. Here, layers of coal marked with uh, dark um, tone. In the short guide that he wrote on the topic, he explained that an isometric drawing was a peculiar thing. The drawing filled up the space, he wrote, between the picture and the plan, between the picturesque beauty of the painter's canvas and the formality of the designs of the mechanical draftsman. That is to say, while it might not represent exact dimensions, isometrical drawings converted Sopwith's discrete vertical geological sections into continuous horizontal ones, thus showing the section of a mining region in all its complexity. I've already identified two spatial strategies in the museum. First, selective sequencing of geological layers of domestic and colonial minerals and of phases of the manufacturing process. And second, 
measured exaggerating of the vertical dimension and of the clarity of boundaries. I should point out another one. The building also invited the visitor to recognize the dense mesh of relationships that its sectional logic laid bare. This exposed section, so to speak, revealed cross-references across and beyond the building. And this kind of cross-referencing work was done for the most part by labels, which frequently included such information as the scientific and common name of a mineral, its density, chemical composition, the location from which it was extracted, and in some instances, even a photograph of its microscopic structure. I should note here that although it was possible by the middle of the 19th century to find detailed museum guides and catalogs, information-rich labels, that is, handwritten or printed information meant for visitors rather than for museum officials was a relatively rare thing. The museum also uh, published information in countless other formats. If visitors wanted to dig deeper into a particular material or district, it was possible to find out more in the museum's library by looking it up in a large volume of gray literature that ranged from official catalogs to reports and from unofficial handbooks to specialized guides. And if a particular mineral needed to be traced to a specific location, the mining records office provided horizontal and vertical sections, as well as three-dimensional models, which in turn could be cross-referenced to maps produced by the geological survey. I'll show those in a second. From 1858, this information uh, became so overwhelming that the museum started publishing catalogs that indexed its own publications. But so what the, why did they need this kind of data? Uh, the data was especially uh, important for entrepreneurs. For example, in 1852, before a company was formed to extract coal from an abandoned mine in Cornwall, investor consulted the sections in the mining records office only to find that this particular site was prone to flooding, so they abandoned the project. Producing information about coal ranked among the most important roles of the museum in the 19th century. The museum's move to its new location followed the reopening of the London Coal Exchange in 1849. This was after the public meetage system, which consisted of public officials weighing coal deliveries to ensure the fairness of the transaction but also to levy taxes was abolished in 1831. Coal's fungibility in London, uh, or London's increasingly free market, depended on this standardization of quantity in the early 19th century. The Museum of Economic Geology continued this process by standardizing quality. Soon after 1851, the museum analyzed Call to make a recommendation about the best kind suited to the needs of the British steam navy. The laboratories of the museum routinely carried out chemical analyses to test the efficiency of coal from around the globe. Comparative analyses of say, specimens from Newcastle to those from Sandy Bay, Patagonia, Chile, or Vancouver Island and these would be surprisingly published in the popular press. One newspaper article from 1843 went so far as to claim that such mineral statistics would be of more importance to the British Empire than all the mines of Mexico and Peru. In this sense, the Museum of Economic Geology served as an information bureau before better known examples started appearing in the 1880s, usually within the institutional frameworks of commercial museums in Brussels, Antwerp, Milan, Vienna, Budapest, Philadelphia, and in the case of Great Britain, in the Imperial Museum in London. 
These museums would offer not only industrial samples, ranging from raw materials to machinery and finished products, would also have uh, offices that provided information necessary to buy and sell these products. Information about prices, tariff arrangements, shipping costs, market conditions, unique to local, etc. While narrower in scope, the Museum of Economic Geology anticipated the commercial museums of the late 19th century by transforming geological knowledge into useful information. Even in the absence of such technologies of filing cabinets, card catalogs, or elaborate indexing techniques that would, for example, be used in commercial uh, museums, say in Philadelphia in the 1890s, its architecture structured information spatially for convenient storage, retrieval, and cross-referencing. But we should ask, who was the imagined recipient of this information? Contemporaneous newspapers reported that the endeavors of the museum were primarily intended for gentlemen who were hereafter to inherit mineral property so that they would have knowledge about the best mode of managing their property untrammeled by agents or middlemen. But also targeted was the much larger segment known as working men. This is the term you find over and over again in the documents, who it was said were the reason why tickets to evening lectures at the museum sold out in an hour. These working men might not necessarily follow the museum's trails of information in pursuit of a particular business opportunity, but as one observer argued, if a working man had the intellectual capacity, the museum might waken up to make him a Watts, a Stevenson, or Miller. That is, the educational experience could turn this ordinary working man into an enterprising inventor. In 1887, when making a case for the Imperial Institute, the secretary of the London Chamber of Commerce would argue that commercial storehouses of information would have to be conceived as educational establishment in the widest sense of the word he wrote, and that this education would be a uniquely commercial education. The Museum of Economic Geology, by this logic, was not only an information bureau. Its image complex, so to speak, was an object lesson in political economy. Which brings me to part three. Mining held a marginal place in classical theories of political economy. Adam Smith, for example, dismissed silver riches from American colonies as a lottery in which the prizes did not compensate the blanks. He privileged agricultural production instead. By the 1830s, however, extraction of value from subterranean mineral resources had come to occupy an important place in debates about the British Empire's economic future. Now, the ingenuity of classical political economy was the claim that free trade and practical knowledge, another way of saying technology, would allow nations to break out of mercantilism, which imagined wealth as a zero-sum game. Political economy promised infinite improvement. And now that growth was supposed to come from mineral resources. This is the first geological map in England and Wales with black uh, indicating coal deposits. British coal production tripled between the middle of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century and would increase fivefold by the middle of the century again. Some argued that coal and steam would unleash land's endless potential. Mining, according to this view, doubled land's productivity since one could theoretically still use the ground for agriculture while digging below for coal, which of course doesn't make any sense. 
Others, influenced by Malthusian calculations, expressed fears about the finiteness of mineral resources almost as soon as mining took center stage. When geologist and theologian William Buckland critiqued Britain's wanton waste of coal, for example, he drew a sharp contrast between the waste of agricultural resources, which he argued was morally wrong, but not irreversible, and the waste of mineral deposits, which was permanent, since it took millions of years for organic matter to replenish itself. So these optimistic and pessimistic views of subterranean resources uh, as a source of wealth came to a head in 1829, when both the House of Commons and the House of Lords established select committees on the state of the coal trade. And mind you, this is six years before the Labesh made his first geological map. So these characters that I'll mention are thinking not with sections, but rather with plans similar to this one. At stake was the question of how to tax coal and regulate its trade. But more relevant here, these hearings cast geological sections in an unexpectedly crucial role. In a testimony in May 1829, some Duke Q. Taylor, owner of mines in Northeast England offered an optimistic calculation. Even after taking into consideration waste, he argued mines under uh, in North, Northern Berlin and Durham alone would produce coal that would last the nation, the British nation, 1,727 years. A year later, Adam Sedgwick, professor of geology at the University of Cambridge, pull this number down to 300 to 400 years. And he did this not because he disagreed with the surface area that Taylor had included in his estimate, a number Taylor had calculated looking at a plan such as this one. He argued, Sedwig argued that the calculation was simply wrong because Taylor did not take into consideration the varying section of this region. The conclusion was clear. It was necessary to engage in sectional thinking to assess the economic value of Britain's coal reserves accurately. That the true value of a subterranean mineral resource was not absolute by, but contingent upon its depth and thickness would soon become abundantly clear to Southwest the advocate of the blank chart that I began with. This was when he was charged by the Crown to collect mineral statistics in the forest of Dean in Western Gloucestershire. In the 17th century, when this forest was enclosed by the Crown to grow timber for shipbuilding, the local populations were given exclusive rights to mine iron and coal. Some of, which, some of which lay on the surface, thanks to a geological peculiarity of the area. These locals were known as free miners, and they used a technique called galing, which consisted of digging, but no deeper than 12 feet into the ground. By the end of the 18th century, however, it was clear that free miners had neither the machinery nor the capital necessary to extract the coal that lay deeper. And notice in the horizontal section below, um, this, uh, the, the black layer, which represents coal, is deposited at a 45 degree angle, which means some coal pops up at the surface but much of it remains underground. In 1838, in the name of improving productivity, the parliament passed a law, which even as it appeared to be reinstating the old privileges of the free miners, opened up the region to big capital. Now, Saltwood's task here was to establish rules for awarding the rights of excavation in the region uh, before entrepreneurs with 
steam engines and locomotives started digging for the coal lying deeper under the forest. For this, Sopwith had to make sections, whether in the form of drawings or, as you see here, in the form of models. Sopwith had two models of the forest of Lime. They were then displayed at the Geological Society of London and the Institution of Civil Engineers before being put on permanent display in the Museum of uh, Economic Geology. And I'm showing you here the smaller of the two models. This was 30 inches by 30 inches. It was scaled at five inches to a mile with the vertical scale exaggerated, like his uh, isometric uh, sections, three times to demonstrate coal veins more clearly. It was divided into 36 squares, each of which represented a square mile, and marked with letters and numerals that were cross-referenced to the museum's mineral statistics. The model hinged open, you can kind of see the uh, split here, to reveal eight additional sections. Sopwith had such models constructed patiently out of hundreds of vertical sections collected in situ. Next, these vertical sections were connected into horizontal sections, which you see in the, right in the middle of uh, this image, uh, and uh, which were then half lapped together to form the skeleton of the model, which you see here below. Making this kind of model might seem labor intensive and expensive, he explained, but the cost was trifling compared to the benefits. In the case of the Forest of Dean, such representational techniques allowed Sopwith to divide up excavation rights between capital and locals in a relatively peaceful fashion. And the free miners had rioted many times before, most significantly in 1836. So data is used here to, to appease the uh, free miners more than anything else even though the free miners did not entirely lose their rights after 1841, most of them ended up having to lease their gales or becoming wage laborers. Still, according to Sopwith, his scientific approach prevented further rioting, precisely because it was guided less by old custom and more by what he called a discretionary power based upon reasonable data. Plans had been crucial tools as commons and wastelands were enclosed through parliamentary acts and consolidated in the hands of aristocracy since the 17th century. Sections now served a similar role for the vertical enclosure of subterranean resources in the name of growing national wealth. Part four. While such models served as object lessons for the more observant visitor, the Museum of Economic Geology conveyed its message more directly through lectures that hundreds attended. Shortly after its reopening, for example, the museum launched two public lecture series on the topic of gold, delivered in its auditorium, again, to working men, the museum's presumed audience. In the 1840s, geologist and future director of the museum, Murchison, predicted that there might be gold in Australia after comparing rock samples from the easternmost regions of the continent to those from um, samples he had taken in the Ural Mountains. This was even before Edward Hargraves discovered the precious metal in New South Wales in 1851, the same year that the museum opened its doors in its new building. The lectures on gold were intended primarily for the instruction of emigrants about to proceed to Australia. The first consisting of six lectures took place in 1852, focusing on topics ranging from the geology of Australia to the chemical properties and metallurgical treatment of gold these lectures attracted so much attention that summaries were published in the popular press. 
while the lecturers delve into a great detail, deal of detail about geology and the colony, their advice was not limited to discovering gold in Australia. J.B. Jukes, director of the Geological Survey of Ireland, for example, concluded his lecture on the geology of Australia by reminding his audience that gold digging was backbreaking work that did not always prove lucrative. Still, he hoped he had offered the audience more than know-how about gold. He told them that the more important lesson to be learned was an attitude that he claimed was embodied in the very act of digging. And I want to show you the quote. This is Jude. You go out to dig for gold. Do not be ashamed to dig for anything else. Recollect that it's the avowed object of your voyage. The only thing you have to trust to. If you fail to dig up gold, there are lands to be plowed, sheep to be herded and sheared, cattle to be tended, corn to be sown and wheat. Every one of these fully as honorable occupations as digging for gold. Go then with a bold and resolute heart, determined to get your own living by the strength of your own arms in the sweat of your own brow, brows and be assured that industry and perseverance lead to fortune in Australia with fewer impediments and uncertainties in the way than in any other part of the world. Digging here then is not simply digging for gold. It's the foremost colonial technique that makes all other colonial forms of exploitation possible from farming to mining, from settling to husbandry. In the sixth and final, um, in the sixth and final lecture of the series of gold in 1852, Robert Hunt, who was also the keeper of the mining records of the museum, reassured the audience fears that the influx of Australian gold into European markets would diminish the value of the metal, he said, were unfounded. Note the image of, I don't know if you can see this, but the image of men digging in the background here. Hunt proved this point in a peculiar manner by making calculations about how much the fortunes of historical figures would be worth in present day money. By Hunt's reckoning, for example, King Croesus gifted 3 million sterling pounds to the Temple of Delphi, and Pericles had 1.162 million sterling pounds available in the treasury for the defense of Athens and so on. Weirdly uh, precise. This was all to prove that gold retained its value as a metallic currency, even during dramatic historical upheavals, a conclusion that might have been challenged by theorists of political economy, especially after the introduction of paper money, but that nonetheless served the purpose of calming the nerves of the public seeking opportunities in the colonies. Hunt, like Jukes, added, Colonials must, colonialists might find no modern El Dorado, but he said, legitimate occupations of the artisan and the quiet pursuits of the agriculturalist, these are his words, were also sources as well. A few years later, when the geologist Warrington Smythe delivered another series of lectures in the museum on the topic of gold, he advised the audience to economize, but economize their most important asset, their bodies, the source of their labor. It was essential, he told them, to know how to calculate one's own worth. This was Homo economicus taken to its logical extreme not merely a Lockean possessive individualism that presumed sensations and labor to be one's first property, but one with calculative capabilities that had been sharpened to such an extent that this subject could instinctively infer a favorable ratio between input of labor and output of profits. Since the miner was the best judge of the value of his own work, Smite advised, the workers should sell their labor through a Dutch auction, a descending price auction that he argued 
um, benefits of the seller. This was where the sectional thinking offered by the Museum of Economic Geology became critical. Not only in the lectures del delivered in its auditorium, but also in the exhibits in its galleries and the proto database in its mining records office. For that ratio between labor and profit to be calculated correctly, both the seller and the buyer had to know about the specificities of geology. So much for recreation and entertainment. Rational recreation and rational entertainment, it turns out, were about working in one's leisure to maximize one's profits. Digging and learning to understand the sections that digging revealed proved to be crucial techniques for the cultivation of this subject. This was a rationality that was informed by the logic of a new phase of capitalism in which a human subject would have to be reimagined in the figure of the homo economicus, whether that subject was an entrepreneur hoping to make the right decision when investing in a mining enterprise or a so-called working man whose calculation was simply to make a living by selling his labor power. Today, we use such phrases as information economy without thinking much because we take it for granted that the relationship between information and the economy is a natural one. But that relationship had to be constructed at a moment when political economy became policy in the 19th century. And I hope I was convinced you architecture and the image complex created by that architecture had a role to play in the forging of that relationship, in the making of the figure of homo economicus. If we have willfully forgotten this history, it might be because ghosts of that figure continue to haunt us today. Thank you for listening. <laughs>